So this paper looks at the representation of multi-species eco-justice, I call it, that emerges out of the work of the Buddhist artist Fenzakai, whom you see portrayed here in a lovely image, uh, in a lovely photograph with a cat on his head. In 1929, Feng published the first volume of paintings on the preservation of life, an impassioned and visually compelling exploration of the Buddhist concept of Hushan. The project began as a collaborative effort with his mentor Li Shutong, a seminal modern artist and musician in the 1910s, who then became a Buddhist monk known as Master Hun Yi. The work in, on the paintings spanned several decades of Fan's life. The last volume was completed in 1973 and published posthumously and comprises of some 450 paintings. These texts, I argue, destabilize the dualistic and antagonistic conception of the human nature relationship Cartesian dualism gave to Western thought. While several other Chinese intellectuals of the time investigated the idea of being human under the changed historical conditions of modernity, Fenzekai's Buddhist-inspired approach to non-human personhood, I argue, creatively probes some of the basic rationalist premises of humanism. In this presentation, we'll briefly look first at the discourse on vegetarianism in the interwar period, and then examine Feng's own contribution to the creation of a Buddhist-inspired ecological view of non-human personhood. Um, The two Buddhists, so this is the cover uh, that you see here, and then this is another wonderful image that shows uh, Fenzakai and Hongyi in, in Fenzakai in, in um, Hongyi in Fenzakai's hand. According to later recollections, every evening at dusk in 1927 in Shanghai, the two men took time to talk at length about various aspects of Buddhist practice and discuss ways to propagate Buddhism. The book, the first book, contains 50 paintings accompanied by a short text written by Honi and includes a vow. I wish all sentient beings can benefit from the merits on the paintings of the preservation of life, develop the bodhicitta and be reborn in pure land. The text constitutes some of the foundations, I argue, in the process of reimagining the idea of preserving life in modern times. If the progressiveness of Feng's aesthetic is difficult to grasp today, this is due in part to its very success. His restrained palette and swift line work, conscious of ink painting traditions, also reflect the print magazine boom of interwar Shanghai and his knowledge of modern woodblock printing. As for the content, in the essay I and Master Hong Yi, written after the death of the monk in 1942, we find an important statement with regards to non-human personhood. Writes Feng, the artist looks at the flowers with a smile, hears the language of the birds, invites the moon to drink with him, opens his door to welcome the clouds, considers nature in the same way as humans, and thus reaches the unity of oneself and other beings. Of course, rituals of animal liberation, as we just heard, and vegetarianism have long pervaded the Buddhist everyday and became the focus of a zealous, renewed attention in the 1920s. Buddhist monastics and householders contributed to the creation of a substantial body of literature on these topics. Many of these texts were grounded in a wish to establish a Buddhist path towards a novel definition of nature, at variant with that of modern Western thought. Nature in Buddhist and Taoist inspired worldviews is itself part of a human um, cultural ideal and does not stand in contrast to all human culture. Actually, no term with the semantic value equivalent to that of the English term nature had developed in pre 19th century China, Korea or Japan. No single term had the capacity to signify the physical universe as an ordered, self-sustaining totality of things. And the modern term for nature, Zeran, was used in pre-19th century China and Japan mostly as an adverb uh, or adjective, meaning in itself, spontaneously. Thus, the success of Buddhist-inspired activism in urban China was in part due to the progressive withdrawal of the old Confucian order in the early 20th century. 
Buddhist associations and redemptive society formed in the novel social and cultural spaces that opened up in Republican era Shanghai. Charities intersected with publishing houses and both conducted ritual activities. The practice of liberating animals and the occasional or lifelong abstention from eating meat became pervasive. Vegetarianism was fashionable and Shanghai urbanites saluted the opening of the Buddhist restaurant Gundaling in 1922. Its motto was promote Buddhism, promote vegetarianism, quit killing, free lives. The well-known Buddhist layman Din Fu Bao and many other elite Buddhists attended the Wednesday feast at the restaurant. Members of the local intelligentsia, writers and actors were photographed while consuming a vegetarian meal. In 1921, uh, the famous monk, uh, Pure Land monk in Guang, published one of his earliest exhortations for Buddhists to observe a vegetarian diet when he wrote a preface for the restoration of a life-releasing pond at Jilo Temple. The text references classics, imperial edicts that sanction the construction of, of life releasing pond, as well as writings on the history of function. Inguang directly links the preservation of life with the vegetarian diet. The text was deemed very powerful because it led people to become abstinent. Likewise, the influential woman of letters, Lu Bichang, in 1931 published a volume, The Light of Europe and the United States, which crucially was also circulated as a morality book. Lu's main aim in writing the book was to introduce the history of vegetarianism and the protection of animals in Europe and America. Sustaining a vegetarian diet, writes Lu, is the civilized thing to do, and Buddhists did it first. It is in this context of widespread Buddhist activism that Feng produces his manhua, a complex form that oscillates between classical Chinese resonances that stretch back to the Song dynasties and echoes of the new ubiquitous Japanese manga. Feng's personal style is based on the correlation between poetry and painting and between image and text. Uh, this is a portrait of Lu Bichang and Ying Guang. And these are some of the images in the first books uh, of Hu Shang Huaji. Each manhua contains a title and is accompanied by a poem by Hoi, Feng, and or other collaborators and writers, or a prose passage, usually some historical anecdote. Keeping a strong focus on the Buddhist idea of preserving life, the drawings develop several sub-themes, specifically about the human treatment of animals. Remarkably, many manhua are based around the flourishing life of non-human animals and plants. Like animals, not, flan, not fun, plants are not just crops and consumables, they are partners in a life-giving relationship. Rather than merely concentrating on animal welfare or on the protection of animal lives, life itself becomes the focal point of Feng Zikai's image texts. Sympathetically, the reader is presented with a large variety of life forms, including trees, but also ants, crabs, and fish. In this image, the crabs show support and solidarity. Another famous image celebrates the fact that a seed has sprouted from a crack in a wall. Yet another one laments the fact that the lives of silkworms are needlessly sacrificed in order to produce a silk scarf. Of course, traditional Buddhist views on animals and humans differ from Western perspectives. According to Buddhist teachings, humans and animals occupy two separate realms of the six uh, realms of existence. These are the realms of hell, hungry ghosts, animals, azuras, humans, and gods, as we saw earlier. Sentient beings reincarnate into these realms according to the good or evil deeds carried out in their previous lives. A human may thus be reincarnated in animal form due to his or her bad karma. Conversely, an animal can be reborn as a human based on its good karma. For Buddhists then, practice is a lifetime process aimed at becoming a bodhisattva and liberating others, including non-human animals. In the enchanted world, of the paintings on the preservation of life, humans are understood as sharing a planet, it seems to me, with other human beings, with other sentient beings that have their own complex ways of being whatever they are. 
all of our fellow animal creatures try to stay alive and reproduce more of their kind. All of them perceive, all of them desire, and most move from place to place to get what they want and need. In fact, many of the scenes depicted by Fenzekai seem to define a network in the sense articulated by Bruno Latour in which agency and personhood are unevenly distributed among humans and non-humans. The gist of paintings on the preservation of life, notes Fang, is to persuade people to cherish life and eliminate cruelty, to cultivate benevolence and stand up for peacefulness. Several of Fang's manhua call into question the human and non-human distinction. In the famous draw, meat or flesh image, the artist depicts a shirtless man who is roughly handling what looks like a sheet that has been placed in a large container. The skin of the animal and that of the human appear almost identical in deliberately highlighting the similarities between the meat flesh of the man and the animal, the ambiguous distinction between human meat and animal flesh is exploited. Similarity and juxtaposition are used in many other images. A child is tied up in an uncomfortable position and compared to a small bonsai tree. A girl and a butterfly are both pinned down by a long nail. Remarkably, in an image entitled Equality, a child and a dog look at each other with interest and understanding. They are, they, are, they are the eyes of equals, says the text, with a quotation from Turgenev. In conclusion, uh, the pioneering work of Fenzekai, Lubichang, Hong Yi, and other Republican era Buddhists attempted to highlight the false dichotomy between the natural environment and human settlements. The, the women and men were aware of the fact that, as ecologists have now clearly shown, human beings are part of a broader ecosystem. According to Buddhist teachings, the Bodhisattva, anyone who seeks enlightenment not only for themselves, but also for the sake of everyone else, reaches awakening by advancing through 10 different stages of achievement and acquires thaumaturgy on this journey so that he or she can bring the cosmos together and deliver beings from suffering. Perhaps following Buddhism's cue, transhumanists in the West have conceptualized a non-anthropocentric theory of personhood. Wherever there is personhood, they argue, in viruses or bacteria, fish or chicken, it should be respected. Likewise, Buddhists in modern China, Tenzakai and Primis, set out to ponder the meaning of life. The artist here vividly represents non-human personhood in ways that in light of our current environmental crisis feel very prophetic. Thank you.